Good evening. It's July 16th. I'm Liz Kruger, the state senator from the east side of Manhattan, with some midtown areas as well. I am delighted that you are joining us this evening, either by Facebook or you may be calling in. If you are calling in on your phone, please remember to keep your phone on mute. While there will be a Q&A portion of this event, we don't have an ability to have you do direct questions through your phones. We always start out with some announcements. Just want to remind everybody that we must continue to stay safe by using our masks, by staying socially distanced from each other as much as we're getting bored to death with that assignment. We must wash our hands constantly. That way, we're not going to get this awful disease COVID. I want to also let everybody know that today, New York State's Home and Community Renewal Agency, the State Housing Agency, opened the application process for the state COVID rent relief program. Eligible households will benefit from a one-time rent subsidy paid directly to their landlords. Tenants are not required to repay this assistance. This is to help people who fell behind because of loss of income due to the COVID um, situation. Applications are available on the website, hcr.newny.gov slash RRP, hcr.ny.gov slash RRP. Applications must be submitted online or by mail within two weeks of today's date. Applications submitted by mail must be postmarked by July 30th. Detailed information about the program, including who is eligible, what criteria, the application process, and answers to frequently asked questions is available on the same website that I just gave you. HCR will also be opening a special helpline to answer questions and provide assistance with the application process. You can also reach the call center at, get a pencil, 833-499-0318. Again, the HCR call center, 833-499-0318. Help is available Monday through Saturday from 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. Every time I do one of these town halls, I must remind you again about the census. If you haven't filled out the 2020 census forms yet, please just do it. We need everyone to fill out their census forms. Census data is used to determine how much federal money we get from Washington for the next 10 years. It also helps decide how many Congress people we have representing us in Washington. As chair of the New York State Senate Finance Committee, I can assure you we need every penny we're eligible from for from Washington, D.C. Because so many people from my district have decided to leave Manhattan at least for temporarily during COVID. I need to remind everyone in every way these, these letters are getting forwarded to whatever address you gave the post office. When you see them, fill them out with your Manhattan address, just because you might be at your second home upstate or in Long Island or in Florida. You are a primary resident of New York City. We need you to fill out that census for New York City. You can also go online to Census 2020 and fill out and submit the form directly online. It won't take you more than about 10 minutes. If you have friends, family, or neighbors who are not in town and may not have done this, let them know they can just get online and fill out the census forms and really do their civic duty. Let's do an overview of what we're gonna talk about tonight. As New York City reopens, businesses and communities face challenges as we learn to navigate the new normal at retail and outdoor dining spaces and other public spaces. This evening, I expect we will have a very lively discussion 
about public spaces with two really excellent guests who I know very well and who are very knowledgeable and definitely not shy. Joining me are <laughs> the Manhattan Borough President, Gail Brewer, also known as the hardest working woman in the political and Christian Klosner, the executive director of the Mayor's Office of Special Enforcement, who I've gotten to know extremely well over the years as I have tried to battle protecting affordable housing from being taken over by companies like Airbnb. Um, but now he's been given even more complicated responsibilities in trying to make sure we keep safe as businesses are reopening. Um, first, we're gonna hear from the Manhattan Borough President who will share information about the remote reopening process, discuss the open streets program, community mitigations, and fair and equal access to public spaces. Gail will also share her perspective on how New York City can rethink the land use planning process and the use of public space in a post COVID city. For people who don't know what a borough president does, one of the most important jobs they have are trying to make sure there is a planning process and smart land use. And here on Manhattan Island, every issue is a land use fight. There's just no way around it because there are so many of us living on top of each other on this fabulous but too small island. After Gail, we will hear from Christian Klausner, who will summarize the city and state's reopening guidelines, outline his role to support businesses and keep communities safe, and provide information about how and where to report complaints about retail and dining establishments and other concerns associated with open space. And I already know, because my office gets them every day, that there are an enormous number of concerns. So I also just want to highlight that some rules changed as of today. When the governor announced, relating to bars and restaurants, that because of the number of complaints and the concerns and cases of failure to comply with the rules on the part of the establishments and the customers, um, he's putting new measures into place, I think, almost immediately. So for an establishment, if you fail to follow the rules and are caught with three different times, they're calling it three strikes, he's going to close you down. Although there is an egregious offense category that could result in immediate closure. He's also going to provide the names of establishments facing disciplinary charges posted on some website or site. Establishments can only serve alcohol to people who are seated, eating a meal, and social distancing, which means there'll be no more walk-up bar service. He's made these statewide regulations. They are not what the city put into effect, but I believe unless Christian shares something different with us, that the city must follow the state's regulation. After the presentation, I will moderate a Q&A. We have questions that were submitted in advance, and you can also submit questions through Facebook. Now it is my pleasure to introduce my friend, the Manhattan Borough President, Gail Brewer. Uh, thank you very much, Senator, and to be with Christian Klausner is also an honor because um, from the day he started, he has been an asset to all of us in terms of his thinking and his hard work about housing at that point, and now he's got everything. And um, I think the whole world thinks that Liz Kruger, I don't care what anybody says, is the best elected official, and I'll just leave it at that because I believe it, um, and it's an honor to be here tonight. So the borough president, as you suggest, it's kind of what you make it. So, but zoning and land use are the first order of the charter. The second is to appoint about a thousand people in the borough of Manhattan. And that does include, as you know, the community boards. And they too have a big role in open space and uh, figuring out about their local land use procedures. We also allocate funding, just like you do and the other elected in the city. And we can introduce legislation with the city council. But the issue of, uh, land use is important. And I can just think about it in the Midtown area, for instance, um, right there near Grand Central. As we speak, there's more open space that even came before the pandemic in terms of right around uh, Grand Central, both 43rd Street 
and the work that the Grand Central Partnership is doing in making uh, tables and chairs available. And then as we uh, move towards uh, the issues of all the planning we did around East Midtown, controversial in some cases, but the money that's set aside from any of the new building could in fact go to open space and could in fact, as an example, what should the median in the middle of Park Avenue look like? Because there's gonna be a tear up underneath and should we have more open space? So we've been thinking about open space for a very long time. And now we have a situation where um, we would like to see these restaurants survive and we would like to see them outdoors because the governor announced today, in addition to what you said, uh, phase four cannot include indoor dining. It cannot include museums because they are indoor and it can't include uh, indoor malls. So we really do need to stay outside. And I have to say, as somebody who has from the top of Manhattan to the bottom, and I've been in Dykeman recently, and I've been in uh, Frederick Douglass, and I've been on the east side, I've been to the Lower East Side, uh, 9th Avenue and 51st Street, all over, trying to see how these restaurants are devising. And I've been talking to the Department of Transportation about how you make your outdoors uh, successful. So it, it has its pluses in terms of people wanting to be out and uh, the restaurant needing to make money. The problem is, how do we stay healthy? Because God knows we don't want a second wave and we don't want to be like those other states. So to the credit of uh, the mayor's office, um, they let us have this open space. We've been working with the Department of Transportation. You'll hear more about the mayor's office of special enforcement and the sheriff, how I must admit, I didn't know what the sheriff did until recently, but I think we'll hear that those uh, inspectors have a role in terms of the restaurants, fire department, department of buildings, consumer affairs and worker protection, maybe the department of health. And of course you talked a little bit about the state liquor authority. Um, I think the police department is taking a uh, standoffice in terms of restaurant issues. Although that would be uh, maybe what any of our constituents might do. So the issue for me of course is when I see uh, we have mask issues sometimes, sometimes we have distance issues, and sometimes we have, you didn't close at 11 o'clock issues. At least that was the case on the uh, indictment. And so the question then is, uh, what do we do? Because we need to make sure that there's enforcement at the same time that the restaurant has the ability uh, to function. There are a huge number of restaurants in the city of New York. There are, just in Manhattan, 4,100 restaurants. 3,219 have alcohol service, 492 now have tables on the roadway. We can talk later how you can jump the uh, bicycle lane if you want and go into the parking space. Uh, 1,290 have tables on the sidewalk, sometimes more extensive than what you and I are used to. And 2,247 have tables on the roadway and the sidewalk. Uh, 49 streets are not open in Manhattan, and that's 21 miles of open just in Manhattan. I'm not talking about the other boroughs. So it's a whole different streetscape, and it's concerning. You walk by, you don't know if, in fact, if there's nobody with a mask, and you're right near on the sidewalk, maybe they're talking could, in fact, infect you. And you're also concerned because you see no um, distancing between the tables, or you see people aren't wearing masks. What do you do? So I do think the city is working. It's tough. Between the 311, who's going to answer? Is it the sheriff? Is it the uh, mayor's office of special enforcement? Is it the state liquor authority? You just described that new process that was announced today. And I know I'm on the governor's uh, task force for recovery, and I know the city and SLA are going to be talking tomorrow about how we coordinate. The city does say that the response rate is one day, a little bit, maybe a day and a half in terms of addressing the restaurant issues, but I do think that's where the uh, community uh, wants to see that something gets done. At the same time, you know, I don't want restaurants to get closed down. And I know when the first uh, example of we are going to be eating outside in a different way came up, there was a discussion, and I'd love to hope this gets revisited, about having more of a community uh, sort of tribunal, if you like. I think the community boards are sometimes uh, a, a, a utilization is not at its maximum. Sometimes the city forgets that they can play that role because they're 50 amazing citizens, as you know, who have leadership abilities, uh, particularly in your area. They're absolutely phenomenal. 
And they, in fact, could be more because I think you can see both sides, the health side and the business side. And there are two sides to all of this. So um, there are hotlines. The other thing that the city offers small business, it is expensive to do PPE. It is expensive. It's an added cost. You often, of course, have to build the structure, which has to be a certain number of inches wide, certain amount of inches tall, and a certain type of stability. And sometimes people don't do that correctly. So that is a cost. Masks, shields. I've seen restaurants with shields and masks changing constantly, gloves, um, all the sanitizing, and so on. So the small business services is free in terms of some PPE, and I think that's an excellent thing. I'm not sure everybody uh, knows that. And then also you have to make sure that um, you have workers that are willing to come back. And I have to say between the subway and fear of health, that's sometimes an issue. Um, and you know better than I some of the federal uh, determinations that are imposed if you take the federal money. It's another whole topic about bringing them back. So I want to say that um, here we are in 2020. Um, I hope that it doesn't rain because I worry about people having their um, ability to do business when it does. The other day we did do a walkthrough in Harlem on one of the streets where there is within a four block area a ton of restaurants. So organized. One person had taken the leadership, all the restaurants were on the tour, and they were figuring out where they should go. They were deciding if they should be the applicant to close the street. Should it be a shared street? Should it be where, what kind of parking should exist? That kind of planning in a neighborhood is what makes both buy-in from the restaurants, buy-in from the community board, and buy-in from people who might have concerns, people upstairs who might live above and have parking concerns, et cetera. So it is a time for New Yorkers to uh, have a different perspective on how they plan locally because of all the concerns that I just raised. But as somebody who spent you know, time on the city council and time now even more on land use and open space, the Times the other day had a big story, as you know, on this topic. What should our street look like? Um, we even have, we have these new mopeds, we have the bicycle issues, you know, only two well pedestrians. And now we have a health concern. And so, um, and the seniors are concerned about everything, I'm sure, I know. So I guess what I'm saying is, here we have an opportunity to look differently at our streets, which I know uh, newscasters and uh, Planners are thinking about, at the same time, we have this major health concern and we want to save our mom and pops in particular, the restaurants that are owner operated. So I, I think this conversation is incredibly important. Of course, it often comes down to enforcement. Enforcement has to work. Um, we also have vendors, that's another challenge that I come up with quite a bit. Um, but I'm here to listen to the questions that people have. And I think that um, this could not be a more uh, challenging, but also fascinating, and God knows the bottom line is healthcare. Thank you so much, Senator Kluber. Thank you, Gail. That was excellent. So now it's my pleasure to introduce Christian Klausner. As I said, he's the executive director of the Mayor's Office of Special Enforcement. And when you think about it, that can mean anything, and I think Christian would agree his job has suddenly morphed into some things he never imagined he'd be dealing with. So thanks for being with us, Christian. Uh, absolutely, and, and thank you, Senator, for hosting the event and inviting me. Um, and thanks to you, both you and Borough President Brewer for your, your very kind words. Um, it, it's been a real pleasure working with you both on the issue of uh, preventing illegal short-term rentals, and your support has made our accomplishments possible, both um, your direct support and, and your relaying of concerns from the community to our office so we could take appropriate actions. Um, your constituents are certainly blessed to have you as representatives. Um, I, I guess just by way of introduction, the Office of Special Enforcement is a mayoral office. Uh, we've existed since the 70s, and it is always in one permutation or another. And it has always been an office that looks to harness the powers and authorities and tools at the disposable, disposal of multiple agencies to address a particularly intractable, intractable problem. Um, most recently, the vast majority of our work was illegal short-term rentals, um, but we have long been involved in, um, in how 
bars and restaurants behave in a community setting. We've worked on a, a variety of other issues, but I, I, I won't take up too much time talking about that. I, I'll get to the topic at hand. Um, because we're a mayoral entity and because our authority is to coordinate the activities of additional um, additional agencies, we were, we've been involved in the begin since the very beginning of COVID in figuring out how to deploy enforcement resources around the city um, with the goal of making sure that the guidelines are followed and that people are kept safe. In the beginning, that was making sure the businesses were closed when they were required to be closed. Um, it turned into making sure that customers in public spaces were being kept safe, that businesses were implementing best practices. Um, it, it, it turned into handing out masks in parks to people when the requirement came online that people had to wear face masks. And then as phase reopening started, and it was clear that the city needed to have a approach to enforcing, uh, we've been involved in setting up a 311 complaint line, handling those complaints, triaging them, and distributing them to the various agencies that respond. Um, I, I've, uh, there should be in the publicly accessible area on the Facebook page a number of links that I think contain key information for folks. Um, if you are a, a business owner looking for guidance, I highly recommend going to the city's SBS website. Um, there are lots, lots of tools. Uh, there's a hotline where you can actually call SBS and get guidance and access to additional information. Um, the second link that I uh, direct everyone to, and this is good both for business owners and for the public to understand, is the New York Forward website. This is the state page. It contains all of the guidance for all of the industries. Um, in the beginning, when reopening started, it was relatively simple. Most of the industries had to follow the same basic sets of rules. As we've progressed more and more and more specialized things open up, those rules have gotten uh, a lot more varied and a lot more complex. And so I, I, I won't try to speak to in general what the rules are around reopening because it really depends on obviously what part of the state you're in, but it, for New York City, it depends on what your industry is as well. Um, but that being said, for everybody, uh, one of the great tools that's on the New York Forward webpage is the business lookup tool. Um, you can do a word search or you can go through by category and try to figure out what industry either your business is in or if you are a, a customer or a neighbor and you're trying to understand what other rules for a business, um, you can do the same thing. You can look it up and see. And it, and it provides pretty, uh, pretty clear guidance, um, especially using the business tool it simplifies, you know, can you be open? If you are allowed to be open, what do you have to do? And the New York Forward page also has very detailed guidance if you want to get into the nitty gritty on exactly what a business um, is supposed to do. Um, there are, um, as was said, so there's lots of agencies that have been opened. More are coming online. Um, you know, we found out today that the governor is not going to extend Phase four, uh, which included a lot of indoor activity, um, is not going to extend the indoor activity. Um, additional on outdoor activity can be expected to come online. And uh, for all of those, there is a complaint system. No matter what the, what the business is, if it's a business that's not allowed to be open, or if it's a business that's allowed to be open but operating not in compliance with the guidelines, um, there is a 311 complaint, uh, complaint line. It's the business reopening complaint. Uh, if you Google that phrase, business reopening, you'll get there. The link is also available on the Facebook page. Um, take the time, if you're going to that page, to, to really try to figure out where it is. It will help us respond appropriately. Uh, but no matter what, um, to file a complaint, what you need is the, ad you need the address. Um, it's very helpful to have the business name and you can either call 311 or you can go online um, and you will get to these pages. Um, I know that there's a lot of questions about who's going to respond. Um, my, my key answer is the city will respond, right? This, is, this isn't a problem unlike any that we've ever had before. I mean, and this is in part why my office was tapped uh, to play a coordinating role because it is all hands on deck. Every agency in the city is doing something to either educate or enforce or support um, and businesses, neighbors, residents, everyone is involved. And 
Uh, my office alone, the Office of Special Enforcement, we have building inspectors, uh, inspectors from the Department of Buildings and the Fire Department. We also have deputy sheriffs and we have police officers. Um, all of them, all of our field staff and investigative staff are responding to complaints, going to businesses, educating them, uh, making sure that they're in compliance, issuing warnings when they're not, um, and even now issuing violations for those that have gotten a couple of warnings already. Um, there are lots of other city agencies. Um, Borough President Brewer mentioned that the sheriff is available. Um, if you ever get a chance to meet the sheriff, um, take it. Uh, he's really a tremendous public servant and uh, really noted for his ability to be flexible um, and, and problem solving and a, a tremendous uh, partner in this. Uh, the, the sheriff's office has been sending deputy sheriffs to these complaints extensively. Uh, we're also working with the Department of Environmental Protection. The Office of Management and Budget has folks who are helping out on this. The, the Mayor's Office of Operations, the Department of Health. Um, it, so many folks are involved in either taking part of inspections or doing the work to support it. Uh, and so I don't want anyone in the public to get particularly hung up on who. Um, in the beginning, it was very much based on geography. Um, the, my office was covering Manhattan and Brooklyn. The sheriff was covering the Bronx and Staten Island. And, and you know, as more and more things have reopened, we are just get you know trying to get to the complaints um, as as fast as humanly possible. Um, and the key thing that can be expected when the city responds is that um, if you're a business and you've had no inspection from us before, you should inspect. You should expect that. Um, you're not gonna get a violation, you're gonna get a warning. You're gonna get information on how to be in compliance. You'll have an inspector who's gonna walk through and say these things are, um, are right, these things are wrong. And, um, you know, but we are tracking that so that if there is a future complaint or future inspections, we'll be aware of, you know, how is your compliance? Is it improving? Is it slipping? Does it warrant a violation? Um, the, the, the key, you know, and I really want to drive this home, right, is that we, we are trying to solve a very complex problem. We want businesses to reopen safely. Um, we, we want them for economic reasons. We want them to open safely for their employees, for their customers, and importantly, for their neighbors as well. Um, and, you know, overwhelmingly, our experience has been that the business community appreciates the visits, um, is looking for guidance, is, is looking for someone to say, you're doing things right, I, these are things you can do better. Um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we'll hear tonight from some folks who've had the opposite experience as well. Um, but, but the goal is to get folks into compliance because really what we're doing is trying to keep everybody safe and healthy. Um, and I think, I think that covers all of the, the top line points I wanna make. There are a few other complaints that are in the Facebook page. Um, there are complaint lines for noise uh, based on what kind of, uh, whether it's a bar and restaurant or whether it's a store, uh, those can go to different places. Um, I know that one of the big topics of concern um, framed in the opening remarks is restaurants and outdoor dining. That is a complaint stream. Um, the Department of Transportation is issuing the certificates and allowing restaurants to take up street space. They are very deeply engaged in inspecting all of the places that have signed up with the city, which you can see on a map. I put that link in as well. You can actually go in, look in your neighborhood and see who has told the city of what they're doing. Um, if they've told the city, that means they've probably also already had an inspection to look at whether what they're doing is right. Um, and there's a complaint stream for structural issues. So if you're seeing you're seeing that the sidewalk is encroached on in an inappropriate way or that um, people can't pass. There are specific complaints in the open dining complaint stream for you. Those will go to DOT. Um, if, if the issues relate to indoor dining or uh, what the employees are doing, those might come into the OC complaint stream. But again, the point is, whatever your complaint is, if you're using one of the complaints that we put in the Facebook link, someone from the city is going to come. Um, if you finally get a complaint, please be descriptive um, and describe precisely what it is that your concern is, and someone will get out there. And so let me pause there, and I'm and, uh, looking forward to the questions. Senator, the Thank only other so thing much. I can think Thank of you. is the Mayor's Office of Nightlife is another uh, group that is very helpful in terms of the moderation and mediation. Just another group that is helpful to me. Yes, and, and I, you know, they not only are they doing direct education um, and outreach events, but they are actually handling um, specific locations, especially as places get more problematic, with an eye to 
finding the owners who do want to do the right thing and getting them the tools while making sure they understand what the neighborhood concerns are. And we already have a question over Facebook for you, Christian, about how do you find the sheriff now that you've told us he's so great? Is he working in Manhattan at all? Well, you don't. Oh, you mean, how do you find him personally? Um, you know, he's always at the mayor's town halls. Um, he's, I, you know, I, I, I don't know how to find him all the time. Um, you know, I call him, he gets, he gets right back to me. Okay. Right. It's um, one of the one of the great one of the great privileges of my job actually is that I once got to serve as a member of the sheriff's posse. Uh, it's a real a real legal thing uh, under the law and, uh, and and quite an honor for me. That's pretty cool. Um, all right, so before we get into all the questions, oh, they're popping up all over. Um, I just want to address a question I got from many people in advance, which I don't really think is a topic for tonight, but I do want to give them an answer. So there were quite a few people who reached out concerned about the growing crime rate and why wasn't I doing something more about that. And I just want to highlight, yes, we are all very concerned about the shootings, um, but to clarify, the people were implying that this was an existing problem in my district. And so we did a little homework. So if we do the research on the 13th, 17th, and 19th precincts, which are included within my boundaries, um, the crime rate is down from last year in each of those precincts um, on almost every category and significantly, and we've had no shootings um, in my district. I'm not saying we couldn't, and I'm not saying that shootings aren't a real issue that I think everyone in government not, must prioritize. We just aren't going to be doing it tonight on this town hall. Um, and also because some people still believe that the bail reforms and police reforms that we passed in Albany have somehow triggered an increased crime rate. We've also reviewed that no one involved, at least who's been caught involved in the shootings um, or really increased violent crimes is someone who would have been in jail if we left bail the way it was, because the only changes we made in bail were for people who were not involved in violent crimes and who weren't picked up a second time uh, while pending the decision in court about their guilt or innocence on the first crime. So there are real issues. The city needs to deal with them. I am not trying to downplay them, but they are not necessarily correlated to things that people think correlate with each other. Um, with that, let's get back to the open spaces issues. Um, so Christian, I think a lot of these questions are for you. Um, oh no, these are actually for Gail, excuse me. <laughs> Our rest, it's, well, because I have little initials next to different ones. Are restaurants required to space their tables six feet apart from each other? I am yes. seeing them very close together some places. Oh, yeah, they are supposed to have uh, tables, and I think Christian would agree, six feet apart. And this would be a situation where you could certainly call 311. Um, you could also go in and talk to the owner and explain that what I think people should do, which is, you know, there we have health concerns. And if you love this restaurant, like, others in the neighborhood, you might not want the government to close me down. Um, because, you know, uh, between the governor and the mayor, they're very serious about health. And if we, if you, you know, continue in this fashion, in other words, what I'm saying is a customer is we love the restaurant. Uh, we don't want to get closed down. But I hope you as the owner understand you could be closed down. And you hope you understand that we as customers love this restaurant and we don't want you to get closed down. So, but the government is very serious. So you need to have six feet, you need to have masks at the appropriate time, and you need to close at whatever time you're supposed to close. If you're on the roadway or in the uh, sidewalk, it's 11 o'clock. So, I mean, it's a, it's a, people are telling me, use the government, I don't know how else to say it, as an example of, they're serious, and you need to follow the law. So that's the only way I can, because I've had to go in and talk to some of the bar owners. Um, I think the governor's, edict today might help because if you are sitting eating and drinking that's fine now you have to drink and sit 
You can't just hang out there with your drink. So I hope that will help a little bit because people do, as you heard earlier, they want to know what the rules are. And they do appreciate when the SLA comes by to tell them. And they do appreciate when a city agency comes by because it is sometimes hard to fathom the writing, you know, the rules that are on uh, New York Forward or in the city. So I get restaurants to say, oh, I was so appreciative of the agency coming by to give me what I'm doing wrong so that I can correct it. So I think people want to do the right thing. Well, hopefully, um, I have to say. Um, a lot of the questions are about people who are concerned that there's you know, there's not enough space between waiters and the customers who are not wearing masks. You can't eat and drink, obviously. Um, and concerned that more young people eating in these restaurants and working in these restaurants are going to come down with COVID, which interestingly, is maybe already true because as we know, the the beginning of the surge that we are seeing is disproportionately among 20 to 30 year olds, actually in the areas of the city that weren't hit the first round, which is my district. So I think people's sensitivity, you know, of others not following the rules is real. Um, and again, I do think that the governor's decision to set rules about not being able to just stand on sidewalks at bars and you know drink and mill around so that you were there's no way that you are staying six feet apart from each other or allowing sidewalks to have a six foot location for people to walk back and forth. I think that the governor's rule change may be very helpful. On enforcement, many restaurants are failing. I'm reading questions here. Many restaurants are failing to comply with the distancing as we've just discussed. And they are also being on both sides of the sidewalk when they're only supposed to be on the sidewalk up against the building um, and that they've, the, the density is so crowded that there's literally no place for people to get through unless they're walking in the bike lanes or in the streets. I know that, Gail, you keep emphasizing the importance that we want the businesses to be able to stay open and they want the help to know what the rules are. Um, but do you think, either of you, what do you think we can be doing to make sure that we really get these issues addressed sooner than later? I think one of the good things that's happened, because don't forget, this started a while ago and our first line of defense was NYPD. That was not working. I mean, people, I think NYPD didn't know what they were supposed to do, and I'm not sure 311 understood it. I think it's good now that um, the mayor's office has a better line of enforcement, because it's my understanding uh, that NYPD is not supposed to be doing this. It is supposed to be the people you heard earlier with the coordination. That needs to be streamlined. That needs to help. Um, because just the other day I was uh, someplace and it was a road and without being specific, it was open and it wasn't supposed to be. So what did happen was all the agencies sat down at the table with the, you know, seven or eight restaurants. It was a very good discussion. And this is what you have to do. So, I mean, other than, um, I don't want, I want people to be able to walk. I don't want people to, um, you know, to be, uh, have masks, uh, you know, people who don't have masks should not be near people who do have masks and are concerned, et cetera, et cetera. So all these rules and regulations have to be very clear, spelled out. You also have a language issue. Not all the rules and regulations are translated. I get that complaint all the time. It may be translated on the city. It's not always translated on the state. And um, I think, you know, the best thing is that the agencies really do. I know the sheriff has been out a gazillion times but you do need to have as much on-site education, particularly where there's a language issue, um, where people are confused about the rules and regulations. I think people should complain about every single instance. So it, it is a complaint-based system, but I also think the city should go out and also uh, give enough information to the community board so that they can help with some of this uh, word of mouth, so to speak. It has never been done before, as Christian stated. Um, we cannot have any kind of a spread. I think the spread came, Liz, my goodness. When I would go to the bars two weeks ago, I mean, in your area, Orchard Street, Dykeman, and uh, 51st and 9th, 
it, you know, it was like being in a uh, a concert with so many exactly. people. It was frightening. Exactly. So I'm hoping that these new rules and regulations will curtail some of that. That's where I find the biggest challenge. So I guess what all I'm trying to say is we got to have very clear rules and regulations and we got to have enforcement and the, and the citizen shouldn't have to be the only person doing it. So this is a question. I'll let me, Christian. Oh, go ahead first, Christian, please. Yeah, I mean, I was just going to add that the, you know, the complaint data also, I mean, we, we appreciate the public letting us know where there are egregious problems. Um, obviously, we can't be everywhere at once. Not only does it give us a chance to go to a particular place and help that business come into compliance and protect the community, um, but it also allows us to understand where we need to take a different approach, right? So if there are corridors, uh, like the borough president was just mentioning, where additional attention is needed, um, then we might create special assignments for the sheriff or, or other agencies, or we might, um, you know, get another agency to come out and take a look at what's happening on the block uh, to look at it on a systemic level. So the, the complaints do serve that dual, dual purpose for the city in helping us address it in the, both the specific and both the area. So for both of you, and this is beyond just restaurants, this is, and there's many, many questions coming in about this. How do you make people know that they need to wear their masks? Because we have concerns that the police don't wear masks, and, and I've had those issues brought to my attention and have reached out to talk to police precincts about it. Um, I know there's a website or a Twitter site where people are sending their photos of police officers without masks. I guess it's an attempt to highlight this is, this is part of your job and you're not wearing the masks. We have people who even get into altercations um, with each other over the mask wearing and the inappropriate <clears throat> taking it off, especially I think with the drinking. So should we have an actual law that you have to wear the mask and somebody's going to find you if you don't? I mean, what more can we all be doing to actually make sure that people are wearing these masks? Because there's more and more evidence that, you know, there's some risk from getting COVID from, from touching things that might be exposed, but that most of the risk is really droplets coming out of our noses and mouths, coughing, sneezing, singing, ironically eating, because when you eat, you spit droplets out. We've had quite a few presentations from epidemiologists. So like the number one thing we all can do to make sure we're not making someone else sick and we're not getting sick, is to keep the bloody masks on. And I'm pretty much running out of ideas on how we get people to understand that and do it. Well, I can start, well, I, I, go ahead, Christian, please, please. Oh, go okay, ahead. yeah, I mean, I, I was gonna say, the executive order does require, and, and I, I see in the, uh, in the chat there are questions about what are the rules. Um, so the executive orders require everyone to wear a mask when you're in public, um, if you cannot maintain a distance of six feet. Um, and this was very much a challenge in a lot of our early enforcement in the parks. People would say, well, I'm, you know, I'm six feet from everyone, except the inspector just walked up to them and now they're not six feet from somebody or they're very close to not being uh, with six feet away. Um, you know, I mean, it, some of it is on us. I, I assume many of the folks on the on the call are like me and slow down if they're getting anywhere close to someone who's not wearing a mask, um, the, I, I do, there is an important distinction um, that you don't have to wear a mask if you're not medically able to tolerate it. And, you know, I do, I do want to encourage everyone to, you know, to bear in mind that, um, you know, that the person could have a medical issue. I mean, obviously we suspect that just by the sheer volume of people we see without masks, but when it comes to any sort of in particular individual you know, keep keep in mind that there could be, you know, whether it's asthma or a skin issue, I mean, there could be legitimate medical reasons. Um, and, and ask yourself, what can you do as well, right? Can I slow down? Can I walk 10 feet behind this person? Can I cross the street? Um, whatever it is. Um, that being said, it is, it is the rule that they're supposed to do it. And for um, retail locations now are, uh, previously, they were allowed to keep customers out, but in um, in phase two, when retail went from curbside to indoor retail, 
uh, they're actually required to make customers wear masks. So all retail locations are supposed to make sure that their customers are wearing masks. Um, and that is something else that you can report if you're in a, a grocery store, a pharmacy, whatever it is, you can report that also in the uh, business reopening complaint line. I find it um, very challenging that the police don't wear a mask because I think us as government officials, I even feel a little guilty if I'm at a microphone and you know sometimes they can't hear you if they have the mask on and you put it down halfway. I've, now I've started just wearing it and if people can't hear me too bad because I think we need to set an example. Now, I assume what's happening because you see cops in you know groups everywhere. Um, I know downtown around the civil ho city hall occupy uh, situation, there's a lot of police officers without masks. And yet a lot of the people uh, in all of the rallies and marches, they pretty much wore masks, but the cops didn't or don't, not all, but it seems like it's around 50-50 or maybe uh, something. They gotta wear masks because we in government have to set an example. We have somebody, as you know, uh, in Washington who doesn't set an example. So we have to set an example. And, and that would help because it's hard to tell somebody to wear a mask when the police officer nearby is not. So um, that would be, that needs to be, it's not hard if you wear the light kind of masks. I have heavy masks and light masks. The light masks are not a challenge in terms of breathing and uh, even in this hot weather. So I, I would say that that would be my first line of defense would be please mandate that NYPD, they all have masks, they all have plenty of masks that they have to wear. I mean, sometimes on the street, I go to the bars, I give out masks and they say, Gail, I have one in my pocket, I don't need one. Well, then why don't you wear it? You're not drinking, you're talking, you're on the sidewalk, even worse, wear a mask. Um, I don't know that we can mandate it in any more than has been under the executive order, but um, it, it's the number one way we can stay healthy. Um, so as far as phase four, which Gail, you referenced that we might be getting to by as soon as next week. But we're not gonna be opening restaurants or bars. Are we open, and I believe you said not museums. So are we opening things like botanical gardens? Yes, botanical gardens and zoos where there is outdoors will be open. And we're opening some of the city swimming pools, I think also? August 1st, I believe. So there was a question specifically to how to decide whether your child should go on play dates with other children and should they be in the playgrounds and should you worry about them touching, you know, playground equipment. And let's be honest, anyone who imagined they can tell a toddler not to touch something when they're out in a playground or not to steal each other's toys. I mean, that's basically evolutionarily impossible. Um, so does anybody have any specific, I know we're not doctors and I always want to say, go check with your doctor about whether they think there's a concern or not, but has anybody been hearing that there's specific standards or concerns about letting your kids go out into these playgrounds and swimming pools, et cetera? Christian, I'll give that one to you. Oh, but <laughs> this this is because I was talking about being a parent earlier. But we're getting ready. <laughs> um, no, I mean these are obviously very personal decisions. Um, I, I think, you know, um, the the state website's a little harder to find. But if you if you do an internet search for state reopening guidelines, summer camps, um, you know there are specific rules for summer camps which are now reopening. Um, and as a parent, certainly that's a decision I've had to to make whether it's a safe decision to put my child in. I, I did actually choose to put my child in, and I was looking very closely at at what the rules are, um, especially because summer camps are you know they're required to keep kids in small pods where they're consistently exposed to the same group of people and not to a hundred other kids. But they don't all require the kids to wear masks, um, and so I think. You know, you just as a parent, I'm only answering this as a parent. I'm no longer the executive director of OSA. I'm, I'm a sympathetic parent. Um, you, you know, you've got to make your own. You educate yourself. Look at what the rules are. Decide what you're comfortable with. And and um, you know, like everybody else, let's let's hope that we we don't catch the catch the virus. And and know and, your kid, right? I mean, I I know that my son's going to wear his mask. And I know we 
we had had an earlier town hall meeting with an epidemiologist who talked about understanding that there are different levels of risk for different activities and trying to keep the level of risk as low as possible for yourself and your family and your children, but understanding that, you know, everybody's going to take some kind of risk. So playing outdoors is much better than indoor. Any kind of outdoor experience apparently is safer than indoor. Smaller groups of kids playing together as opposed to larger groups is safer. Um, you know, swimming pools, somebody must have determined for the city it was okay to open the pools. Um, I know that a number of places are already setting up or have set up like the sprinklers on the playgrounds where the kids run through the sprinklers, you know, maybe in a bathing suit, those are for the little ones. That seems like, you know, that's something that you could probably have your kids doing with watching them, but it's really hard. And the bigger even question, and I will switch it to Gail because I'm not a city elected, everybody wants to know whether they should send their kids back to school if the city says we're opening the schools. And you can argue that in 15 directions also, Gail. No, I, I, I'm worried about it. Um, today, the chancellor announced that if you want to keep your child home, you can. And of course, that means a couple of things. I hope it doesn't get into a racial uh, challenge because uh, the parents who can stay home are going to keep their kids at home. And we know those parents could be, not 100%. And then we also have the next challenge of, if we're gonna be in the school, is it safe? Um, is there gonna be enough cleaning and disinfectant? And the school could only be 49% occupied. So we've all been, uh, you know, is the principal's office available? Is the gym available? What does the outside playground look like? And in Manhattan, as you know, we don't have like miles of, uh, you know, fields uh, near a school. We have maybe a playground. So all of that, it means that you're only going to be in school a few days a week and then you're going to be home. And then to the, the mayor announced today uh, 100,000 childcare slots. Um, this is, uh, I don't quite know how this is going to work and, and it has not been signed off on by the governor, as you know. Between August 1st and August 7th, the governors uh, and the Department of Education are going to review any plans from any of the municipalities and counties in the state of New York. So it's, it's still very iffy, and I am worried, too, that people are going to go to, you know, move to the suburbs where it seems like it's a better bet on the schools. They are, already have an increase in Long Island uh, from New Yorkers, as you probably know, and uh, charter schools and private schools. So, uh, um, and also the virtual didn't work too well for the last semester. And, of course, during the summer, my understanding, we have 178,000 uh, students in summer school, 36% have not opened the device yet. So that's a pretty high number. Mm -hmm. I would say it's a challenge. And the private schools, and I know you have a lot of constituents in private schools, are doing the virtual better. And I wish that we could do the virtual better because we're concerned about health of students, families, and teachers and administrators. But we're also concerned about the academics because that's another part of our society. So it really adds up. I think of all the challenges that we're facing right now in terms of, you know, you've got the economic, you've got the uh, health, and you obviously have the racial, now you've got the educational. So it, I would say it's a, it's, it's a, I don't even know if I give it a C plus, maybe a B minus right now, in terms of where we're going with this education. I'm very concerned. Has anyone um, proposed outdoor classroom settings, yes. at least yes. until it gets yes. really cold? Yeah, I mean, I think even, you know, some folks, I've been looking at this. Can we put a tent with the uh, fans during the summer and, uh, you know, heaters during the winter, literally? Because the notion that kids are going to be home and then go to school and then home and then go to school, that's challenging in itself. Not to mention, um, how does this childcare work? Childcare is going to be available for, I guess, for uh, small children up to eighth grade. I'm not, it was just an announcement, so I'm not quite clear what it, involves. Uh, and I spent a great deal of time on a Zoom last night on the issue of child care, working with Columbia University and, and uh, you know, some of the daycare council people and the settlement folks who are so excellent. It's so complicated. And a lot of teachers understandably don't want to come back into the classroom. So it's hard. It is hard. There's so many hard questions. So um, somebody's raised a question. I think this might have to be the last one given the time. 
about the commercialization of hops. Um, what is the city's policy, Christian, on hops becoming outdoor um, commercial space? Have you, have I'm you not sure what that, that means. Um, pop, um, those small, oh, what does a pop stand for? Privately they... operated public spaces. Thank you, Gail. So those little pocket parks you see between buildings all over Manhattan, south of 86th Street. Uh, yeah, I mean, that, that that's a hard one without context. I know that, you know, when we were going to parks and making sure that people were maintaining distancing rules, um, we were doing that also in some of the privately owned public spaces. Um, and, and even within them, it's different. Some of them contract with the city to provide certain services. Some don't. Um, it, it really depends on the, on the specifics. Generally, you know, people are supposed to be wearing a mask if they can't be six feet apart from each other, and that's the, the key provision. Um, and I, you know, I mean, I think is also as consumers, right? We we should, if we see a place that's not behaving, we should avoid that place and ideally let them know we're avoiding it. Thank you. Um, speaking speaking of the outdoor space, I did want to make a point earlier. Um, you know, just when we're that. There is an interesting irony here, right? That that a lot of the science is showing it's the indoor spaces, right? Is in, to the degree that New York Forward is slowed down, it is slowed down in the indoor spaces while continuing full steam ahead in the outdoor spaces. Um, and so I think you know we should all be mindful that when we uh, finally get to go outside or when we brave going outside and and put ourselves at risk, that we're seeing things that we don't normally see. But they're but if they're outside, there's also just a lower risk than the stuff that we see inside. Um, and so I just, you know, I ask folks to, you know, be mindful and thoughtful about about that and and to, you know, to take into account that their the transmission risks are actually lower for outdoor activity. So with that, I have I want to thank you both so much for coming on tonight. As we all know, we don't have the answers to everything. We are struggling to come up with the right answers or the best answers that we can develop to ensure that for our city, eight and a half million people can continue to live and function and stay healthy. Um, and just to remind everybody, and it was one question, what if we see surges and changes and growth in the caseload, will we make changes in policy? And the answer is absolutely. Um, if this, and the governor has been very clear on this, if there's movement backwards with the growth in COVID, um, we can go back from level four to three to two to one. Nobody wants to, but what we really don't want to ever have is a giant spike um, as we got, as was the beginning of the COVID experience for us here in New York City. So we will continue to try to move forward as effectively as we can with as much both common sense and good science and policy as we can. But if it's not working, then we will have to change midstream um, because that's the only choice we will have. So again, thank you, Gail. Thank you, Christian. Our next town hall is scheduled for next Thursday, July 23rd, 7 p.m. again, with Dr. Peter Steele, Director of Clinical Services, Department of Emergency Medicine, at New York Presbyterian Wild Cornell Medicine. And Dr. Steele is going to talk to us about navigating the healthcare system and letting us know where, when, and how to safely access healthcare in the time of COVID. Because while telemedicine is amazing, sometimes you actually really need to go see a doctor. So stay well, stay safe, wear a face mask or covering over your nose and in your mouth to help keep others safe too. And thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Signing off. <laughs>